Well, first of all, thank you very much for um, reaching out and inviting me to share some of my experiences um, about using telemedicine. Um, if you don't know, my name is Amy Jose. I'm a registered nurse. I'm a certified diabetes, well, actually, excuse me, I'm a certified diabetes care and education specialist. Just call me a diabetes educator. Um, and I've been working at a company called Steady Health uh, for the past year. Prior to that, I worked in a traditional large clinic as a diabetes educator, and I was presented with an opportunity to try something new about a year ago, sparked my interest, um, and I said, I got to try this. This is too good to be true. So last year, I joined a company called Steady Health. And if you don't know about Steady, um, we're the nation's first full service, fully virtual diabetes clinic, serving members right now currently only in California, but with um, plans to expand soon. Our clinic opened up in 2019 uh, with plans to see members both in person and virtually. However, we quickly learned that about 80% of our appointments were actually being scheduled virtually. So in January of this year, we decided to take a leap. We closed our in-person clinic and we went fully virtual. Now, this decision was not taken lightly and there was much thought and many difficult decisions to be made. But because our care model is different than a traditional diabetes clinic, we were confident that we'd still be able to provide great diabetes care remotely. Now, at Steady, we combined the power of CGM or continuous glucose monitoring a proprietary data aggregation platform to Steady Health with an understanding that communication outside a scheduled visit is just as important as the scheduled visit time itself. Uh, this new care model has us work alongside a patient continuously to help get blood sugars in control. So how exactly do we do this? Well, we provide all of our care over video and messaging while accessing member data remotely. So not only do we just review blood glucose data from CGM, but we actually review medications, meal photos, physical activity, and all of this again is through our proprietary platform that I just mentioned. For steady to succeed, data is critical. Uh, but most importantly, we do everything a traditional endocrinology office does. We write prescriptions, we um, send out for labs, we give referrals, we provide what I do, full diabetes education, and all the other paperwork that's necessary to keep a clinic or an office running. Um, our whole model, though, is built around CGM because we really believe it's a revolutionary technology that's redefining diabetes management um, and shaping the future of diabetes care. So if there are any questions at this point, I think Chris was going to open it up for questions from the community about STEADY before I dig into the meat of the presentation. Uh, so I guess in terms of STEADY Health overall, um, over the course of a given day, like how many patients are you interacting with? I imagine that would sort of vary depending on, on their needs, right? Yeah, um, well, the day is split usually between in-person visits or video appointments and um, responding to messages. So um, it's honestly, I'd say more communication on our message platform than in-person visits. Um, so it really depends on the day, but I generally take an hour or two in the morning to do messaging, if not more. And then um, I may have anywhere from, I don't know, three to five or six appointment video appointments in a day. And remember, I'm a diabetes educator, so I have longer appointment times than a right. physician would. Um, a typical appointment with me is an hour appointment. Okay. Um, I do know that um, from past webinars, there's always been a lot of conversation around um, the CPT codes and the billing and how that factors in. Um, 
I, I don't think we need to spend the entire webinar talking about the steady business model, but how, how do you account for, um, you know, keeping the lights on? Yeah, great question. Uh, so we do bill insurances for endocrinology visits, just like a traditional clinic does. Um, so we are um, in-network providers with, um, with many um, uh, um, uh, insurance companies. And then uh, we are also a member-based program, which supports all the other stuff to keep the lights on. Um, and it's a small $60 a month membership fee that allows any member um, full access uh, from nine to five <laughs> right. to the endocrinologist, Dr. Calvin Wu, and myself and our member care coordinator. Okay. Uh, we actually did get a couple of other questions coming in from the uh, attendees. Thank you, Shushma, for your questions. One of them is, um, how many endocrinologists on staff? I think you just mentioned there's only one endo on staff currently, right? We have one endocrinologist on staff right now. Again, that's Dr. Calvin Wu. Um, our medical director is um, a diabetes specialist as well, and he um, currently is not practicing in the U.S. because he's actually from Sweden. Okay. But we have uh, the second resource there. Got it. Um, another follow-up question from Sushma is, um, how do you do the physical examination part of your appointments? Do all patients have a primary care physician? That is what, That was one of the biggest challenges that we faced um, when deciding to go from in-person clinic to fully virtual. And um, we've come up with a really creative way to address that because the physical exam, as you know, is gr greatly important. Um, what we've done is partnered with primary care physicians and all members are required to have a primary care physician that um, they see at a minimum once a year to perform those necessary in-person exams. So the foot exam, the whatever, whatever the other exams are that we're gonna need to, to have physical documentation from. We have a form that we created to educate physicians and we'll send that to the physician um, and introduce ourselves as, um, as the member's partner in their overall diabetes care. And we okay. receive those back signed and fully filled out and documented that goes back into the patient's chart. Cool. Um, I think that's it for questions right now. So we can carry on with the rest of the slides and we'll pop back in as the other questions show, show up. Great. Okay, so now the meat of the presentation, some practical tips for effective telemedicine visits. Now, I mentioned that I joined Steady Health um, a year ago, and over the last year, I have been challenged in more ways than I ever expected. Uh, learning to give great care over a screen has definitely proven to be challenging on many fronts. But my hope today is to share some learnings, some failures, and to make your transition smoother. I want you and your patients to be emotionally prepared for this care transition. But more specifically, let's discuss how we're gonna successfully move from behind the desk or an exam room to behind a monitor. And I wanna get you giving great diabetes care, the care that you're used to giving. So you're not at the wrong webinar. You're at the correct webinar that does say match, and that is match.com. If you're old enough, think back to 1995. Where were you? What were you striving for in your career? What, were you single? Were you sick of going to bars to meet people? Or was your mom still setting up you on dates? Well, if so, you are probably searching for a better way to meet a partner. Enter match.com. We all say, what? No way. This is a crazy idea. It'll never work. We said it, but guess what? We were all wrong. And match.com has transformed how strangers now meet and build relationships. There's no denying that. So fast forward now to 2020 and enter telemedicine the match.com of healthcare. If you think about it, 
there are so many similarities. The first, courtship, right? It's a concept as old as time. It's not only critical for finding a mate, but it's critical for healthcare. Because really, who wants to share intimate details about their diabetes with someone they just don't connect with? The other similarity is that the concept in itself is crazy, right? It's questionable, it's intriguing, it's highly skeptical, but it's 100% doable. This really is just a new approach to an old problem with similar goals. Now at Steady, we connect with our members remotely, emotionally, but all with the power of data. And we meet our patients where they are and with their unique challenges. So now that we're kind of talking about dating, relationship building, let's discuss some rules of engagement for telehealth. And while I'm being a little facetious, I'm being very serious at the same time with, with all of this input. And these are learnings that I have gained along the way that are not talked about a lot, uh, but I do think are important to share. So the first one, again, when you're in your courtship is don't be a creep. Seriously, eye contact is important. And you want your patient looking at you, not somebody else, so you need to look them in the eye as well or in the camera, which is challenging, which is challenging, which is challenging. It's not a comfortable, uh, natural place for people to be. But if you're unable to look in the camera, explain that to your patient. Let them know where your eyes are going. Right now I'm looking at my other screen that has your data on it, that's why I'm not looking at you. Members wanna know that you're paying attention to them. And if my eyes move away from the screen, I want them to know that I'm still concentrating on them. The next thing in order to have a great engagement is to be honest acknowledge the limitations of this arrangement and have a backup plan. So if there's an interruption of any sort, it's super important to explain that you may not have an answer or a solution, but that you will make sure to find the appropriate resource for help and close the loop on whatever the issue is. So for me and for us at Steady, a really big problem that we had at the beginning was finding the right video platform to use for great communication, for stable communication, for reliable communication. Um, we went through weeks of troubleshooting. We had some really poor quality video appointments that resulted in a lot of extra follow-up on my part. But as long as I was honest with the member, and let them know that we were going through this transition together, there were no issues. The, the, the members are entering into this engagement understanding that there are limitations. So the devil, yes, is in the details. Um, we learned that a good setup, a stable platform is super important. The right lights is super important. A microphone, having a professional background are super important. Um, and our members went through this growth with us and were completely accepting of it. Um, so that kind of moves into the next topic and that is be vulnerable, okay? It builds trust. Vulnerability, I can't say the word, but vulnerable, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Um, it just, it breaks down some barriers. Um, and I think, we all need to acknowledge that there's no rule book right now for telehealth. It's just too new. Um, but this also translates really well to diabetes care because as we all know, there is no one right way to manage diabetes. And we are all figuring this out as we go, both how to do um, telehealth, but also how to manage somebody's diabetes for them specifically. The last thing that um, is super important to understand is that you have to be prepared. So 
in a clinic setting, you're going from appointment to appointment to appointment. You have a flow. You know how to get caught up in the middle of an appointment and how to quickly get through your EPIC system to find the right information when you have actually got the patient in your office. Well, it's a little bit different when you're doing telemedicine because you're controlling a, a few more um, windows. And um, so it's super important to be prepared. Both you and the, and the patient need to come ready. So being on time is super, super important. Um, being ready. So this drove me nuts at the beginning when we were working. Members would come to these appointments as if they were hopping on a call with their mom, their brother, their husband, their child. And they would be on the call, in the kitchen, making their dinner, not focused. They don't have their data handy or, or their notes ready or, or available. The best one was when we had a gentleman who, great, great individual, but so unfocused. And it was really hard to have that appointment. So unfocused that he was late to the appointment. We still continued. We shouldn't have but we still continued. And then he needed to get into his car and go pick up his daughter at wherever he was going to pick her up at. At that point, I had to ask this gentleman to reschedule. Um, it just, it's not safe. Like, I don't want to be having <laughs> a very important discussion with somebody about their health if they're not fully 100% vested in the call. So we asked the gentleman to reschedule not a problem at all. And that's a great thing about telehealth is that rescheduling isn't a huge deal with telehealth. You don't have to take the extra time out of your day to, you know, leave the office, to drive to the physician's office, to find the parking, to find your way through the clinic, to sit and wait, to hope that the doctor's on time. It's just, yeah, sure, no problem. Go online, quickly find the appointment time that's gonna work best for you when you're focused and ready. So being prepared is super important and it's important for the members to understand that. So I have no problem telling people, you know what, doesn't look like now's the best time. Let's reschedule this. Let's just hop back on another call another time. Um, there are a couple things that I want to share that are not necessarily unique to telehealth, but I have found that it's super important and helpful to reiterate in this new um, form of communication. And that is to just remind your patients that this new space that we're engaging in, it's still a judgment-free zone. Okay, in these four walls, so to speak, information is information and there's no judging allowed. It's information so we can help you lead a better life. The other thing that I like to let people know and remind them is that negotiation and discussion are encouraged. It's kind of awkward moving from behind a desk to behind a computer and not having that physical uh, contact with somebody. And so sometimes discussions are a little bit awkward and stale at the beginning. So just reminding people that it's, you know, discussions encur is encouraged and negotiation. It's all about negotiation with diabetes. Cause like I said earlier, there's no one way to do diabetes. Question related to that, Amy, mm -hmm. um, as it relates to sort of getting new members, new patients, um, prepared for their first telemedicine appointment, how much um, sort of expectation management do you do via text or email versus how much time do you spend at the beginning of your first appointment sort of laying out the ground rules of like, okay, like I have a two monitor set up, like explaining like why you might not be looking at the camera, explaining, you know, being open and honest, like how much of that yeah. is set in, in messages beforehand versus just an actual, um, you know, face-to-face -face virtually conversation to sort of get them on the same page in terms of what you're looking to accomplish and what their expectations should be too. Yeah, no, um, that's, it, that's actually a really good question. And it's because by the time a member has a visit with me, they've already been in communication with um, both our member coordinator who is uh, getting them set up for that first appointment um, 
and the endocrinologist. So at Steady Health, we have a um, very, uh, very specific care model where once we get a member signed up and set up with our app, with um, understanding how to do data logging, meal logging, um, they go through, they, they have their initial appointment with Dr. Wu, um, and there's a lot of introduction um, discussion in that initial appointment with Dr. Wu about who Steady Health is, how Steady Health works, how this will work, this communication. And then they actually spend a full week um, of what we call tracking, and that is doing very intense um, logging through our app of meals, exercise, medications. Um, and for that week, that member is having a very intense communication um, relationship with Calvin, with Dr. Wu, through our messaging platform. And so they get a lot of experience with how Steady is set up in that first week. At the end of the tracking period, Dr. Wu and the member have what we call a tracking review appointment, where he actually comes back, has a one-on-one -on -one appointment with each member, and presents a full slide deck to that member of what insights he has learned and what recommendations he has specifically for that member and that member's diabetes, and then sort of passes the buck for the patient to start working with me. So by the time the members come to see me, they've already had a lot of interaction and understand how the study model works. Okay. Um, as you're talking about this process now, it sounds like, you know, from my perspective, at least a pretty well-tuned um, process. Um, how long did it take for you all to sort of identify that this was the way forward in terms of that initial um, initial appointment mm -hmm. setting? Yeah, like here's how long we need that like first intensive period to go in terms of like getting the patients used to the, yep. the, the steady health experience. Like how long did it take to sort of um, complete their transition into the steady health approach of things? <laughs> well, you got to remember we're a startup. <laughs> Which, we're small, we're nimble, and we can make decisions and changes really quickly which right. I understand that most of the people that are listening to this right now are not in that situation and are on a cruise ship and trying to steer a cruise ship in open waters. So it's very challenging, I understand that. Um, honestly, that's one of the reasons that study intrigued me was because I wanted to see these changes happen and you can't do that very easily or at least in the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the clinic that I was at prior, it was challenging. Um, everybody understood it and wanted it, but to physically make it happen was, was challenging. It can be done, it can be done, I believe that. Um, but we went through probably, in the time that I was there, and I was not the first um, clinical hire, three full iterations of our care model and trying to perfect what was the right balance of appointments, who should be in the appointment, how do we follow up um, until we came to this care model? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And we gave each we gave each rendition a couple of months. Okay. Um, so and there was a lot of review form. afterwards of yeah. what's working and not what's not working. We did a lot of um, uh, with the member's um, approval. Uh, we did a lot of recording and listening to our appointments and evaluating the appointments. Mm -hmm. We also did member interviews to see how the member felt the appointment was. Huh. So it wasn't just a one-sided experience and decision. Yeah. Um, one more question before I let you get back to uh, mm -hmm. your stuff. And this is a question from Jack, and I swear it's not a plant. Uh, does Steady also utilize Tide Pool for uploading data? Um, if, if uploaded ahead of time with good preparation, can you then review Tide Pool results um, during the appointment? Absolutely. That's exactly what we do, actually. So our proprietary background um, data platform that I briefly mentioned at the beginning um, collects everything except pump data right now. That's the one thing that we're still building is integration of pump data. So we do, we have a large amount of 
uh, members who are utilizing pumps. And the best way <clears throat> that we have right now and that we're most comfortable using is having members with pumps, excuse me, <clears throat> um, build a tide pool account and, um, and share their data with us. And that's exactly what we do. And in, in, um, we'll have them upload prior to an appointment, but also in between appointments, if I'm having communication with them, and I'll get to that at the end of the presentation, um, I do a lot of tide pool reviewing, data reviewing, a lot. I will take screen grabs of um, trends and mark them up and send them back to the member so they see exactly what I'm seeing and understand why I am making a recommendation. So it's a very powerful tool for us. Alrighty. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else or can I move on? I think you can move on for now. I think okay, we got one great. more in the queue, but we'll, I'll bring it up a little bit later. Okay, it seems like very a good, good sort of round out question. Great. So, okay. So I think you guys all understand the rules of engagement. Um, let's talk a little bit about how to embrace the advantages of telehealth, right? It's this big, scary transition for everybody. But honestly, there are so many advantages um, and opportunities to learn new things about both new patients, but also existing patients. So the first thing that I learned when I transitioned to this behind the monitor was that telehealth or telemedicine, whatever you want to call it, it actually evens the playing field. It's your patient may have the, the, the home field advantage, so to speak, but you're going to benefit in so many new ways. You're going to understand, first of all, very first of all, first thing you must do when you come onto that first appointment is thank your patient for inviting them into their personal space. Okay, this is a big deal for a lot of people. And I've seen a lot of really surprising things since I've been behind this monitor that I would never be exposed to in a clinic. So these are very personal places for people to be sharing with you. Some are very embarrassed about things and you have to be as absolutely non-judgmental as possible about one's personal situation. Um, once you thank them for allowing, them, for allowing you into their space, patient tends to be more relaxed. They open up. Just I'm, I always start with a little, oh, hey, how's it going? Catch me up on this. Or, oh, I noticed this in the background or whatever, just to break the ice a little bit. Um, but I think, you know, another great thing about being in their personal space is that you actually get to see who's on their team instead of them seeing who's on your team, right? You've got the front desk receptionist, you've got the nurse, you've got the endocrinologist, you've got the billing specialist, all when they come into your space. But when you go into their space, you get to see who's on their team helping them manage their life and their diabetes, which is really important because we all know that nobody does diabetes alone. It is a team effort. So for example, the other day, I was on the phone with a new member, this lovely lady, um, and at the end of the appointment, it was starting to wrap up, and her nephew came in, her grandniece came in, they wanted in on the conversation. I was able to kind of get a sense of family and the importance of family, and that will help me better understand how to help this individual manage their diabetes. Um, Another really fun thing that I've seen um, are other support members that people have. It's not necessarily people for everybody. I see a lot of dogs and pets in the screen with people. And it's really fun to have a conversation with people about their pets. It can lead to some really good creative solutions for people as well. So whomever I'm talking to, your dog, Rodney, how frequently do you take Rodney out on a walk? Maybe you should start taking Rodney out on a walk after a meal, if that's where you're having a trouble time with your blood sugars. Um, so cues like this and understanding who's on people's team really have helped out. Um, the next thing I think that's a super incredible advantage to telehealth is 
um, you can treat it like a home health visit. And I don't know how many of you out there have done home health visits, but when I was back when I was in nursing school, um, when I lived in Las Vegas, actually, I had a, um, a clinical assignment with the TB clinic in town and I had to do home health visits. And that was the most eye-opening experience of my life. I learned so much. And transitioning to being behind the computer right now with people is so reminiscent of doing some of these home health visits. Um, I have learned to fine tune my observation skills. Um, you'll see things that you'd never witness in an office. You'll look at people's sleeping arrangements. Um, are they cohabitating? How many people are in the house with them? Um, the other day, and I'm not kidding when I say this, um, with this shelter in place um, order, I was on a call with, um, with a member that we've been working with for quite some time. And each appointment has been in a different location, but this appointment was in a room. And he rents a room in a house with some other roommates. Um, it was three o'clock in the afternoon and we were catching up. And all of a sudden I saw <laughs> uh, this nice, lovely liqueur bottle come across the screen. <laughs> and pour. And I thought, did I see what I just saw? It's three in the afternoon. Hmm, I'm learning something new here. And then that went away. And then a second later, I see come across the other side of the screen, the soda bottle to make the mixer. And then that bottle was tossed back on his bed. And I'm just sitting there. I'm like, I'm just going to watch this one because we've got some other clues to start digging around with for other conversations later. Um, he continued to sip his drink in his red solo cup. I said nothing. I just made note of this. And I will certainly use this as a topic to come back and discuss later as this patient actually is experiencing low blood sugars. And now I have an idea, something to dig into as a potential cause for low blood sugars that this patient has been um, experiencing. Um, another example of why I view this as like a home health visit, whereas somebody in a home health visit might not be pouring themselves a drink, but you understand the point, um, is that this other member um, is a full-time caretaker of her brother-in-law. And it was my first appointment with her, and that's all I knew. I didn't know the age of this um, the person that she's taking uh, care of. I didn't know the exact situation, um, how much help, how little help, how independent uh, this person needed. But in the middle of our appointment, the member needed to feed the brother-in-law. Brother-in-law was an elderly individual with the capacity of about a seven-year-old who could not um, care for himself at all. So what I was able to do was observe her uh, get the food. I, I was able to see exactly what she was feeding the brother-in-law and make some mental notes about meal preparation habits and what her daily routine is like. So that will help me understand what I can realistically ask somebody to do and what I shouldn't realistically ask somebody to do. So home health visit, think home health visit. Um, the next really great advantage of uh, telehealth is just like in real estate, right? They all say location, location, location. Well, you can learn so much as I've already shared with you from somebody's surroundings. Um, Another really great example of a big learning and a big aha moment that I had was a member that every appointment we had, she was sitting in her car. And she, at the beginning, told me that that was the only place that she had any privacy for our appointments. Completely understandable, that's fine. Well, as our appointments went on, um, and we started broaching upon the topic of meals and eating and cooking and where she's getting her meals and me reviewing her food logs. Um, I asked her if 
she cooks very much. And she said, no, um, it's challenging for her to cook. And everything just opened up. It was amazing what I learned. Basically, what I learned is that she's a hoarder and does not have the space, or rather does not have access in her kitchen to even use her stovetop or her oven. So she eats out every meal and she eats either at work or in her car because there's no comfortable place for her to be in her home. So as heartbreaking as that was to hear, I knew I had to completely change my approach to how I was gonna work with her on her meal habit, meal, meal planning habits. Um, and of course I thanked her for sharing that with me because that was not something easy to share. Um, another thing that is super great about telehealth um, are the support services that you can have using remote um, communication. So I mentioned earlier that we will record appointments with patients with, with their approval. Um, and I'll do that even for one-on-one -on -one appointments so I can go back and review and see and, and just assess my, my own skill set. Um, but there's translation services that are easily accessible um, and are a simple addition to many video services. We also used to have a scribing service and that was great at the beginning when our first appointments, we could completely focus on the, on the member, knowing that we had a scribe in the background listening in and taking notes. We didn't have to focus and worry about, oh, am I getting all the notes in, am I getting all the notes in? And everybody knows how hard and difficult that is. So scribing services are fantastic use um, um, support for, for telehealth. Um, the last thing that I wanna talk about uh, with telehealth is that you can get so creative, so, so creative with being behind a monitor. Um, one of the more fun things that I have done with people that I'd never be able to do in a clinic setting is to do kitchen tours, right? So when you're teaching somebody how to carb count, let's say, um, they'll come in and ask a few questions about, oh, I like to eat bananas, or oh, what about this tortilla, or oh, what about this restaurant, and you do the best you can. Well, via telemedicine, I can go into somebody's kitchen with them, have them open up their cabinets, and we can look at food labels together. We can look at what's actually in the cabinet, what's not in the cabinet. We can talk about meals that they eat. It's really been eye-opening and it's been really fun for the patient because it's real time for them and they're getting answers to questions that they have right then and there. Another thing um, that's super fun to do is to have somebody just open up their medicine cabinet. Um, do a full medication review with somebody. Have them go through their meds. Are they storing them properly? Do they have proper disposal of their medications? Are they expired? Do you have sharps container? Is it high up where kids can't reach it if you have kids or pets? Um, you can talk about people's emergency kits. Do you have your diabetes emergency kit ready? Let's go through that together. Let's see if it needs to be updated. Um, Last example I have is probably the best, and that is behavior change. So we talk to people in the office about new ways to um, change behaviors. And a lot of the time it's around food, but a lot of the time it's around exercise and being active. And I have one member who um, gets very anxious about the thought of organized activity and goes into this head spin of this planning mode. What do I have to do? What are the steps to get me organized to make sure that I can get to whatever the end goal is? Um, so I've worked through a member, not worked through a member, but I've worked with this member to get through these barriers to being active and said, what do you have now? And she showed me everything. 
She pulled out the resistance bands that she bought. She found them while we were on the phone together. She pulled them out. We went through them. She read the instructions for me. We decided what color bands equaled what resistance, where to start, and decided that the goal wasn't to use resistance bands for 10 minutes a day. The goal was to have those resistance bands out and viewable for that member to use whenever she saw them. So that at the end of the appointment was a huge win for both of us. I had no idea how difficult it would be for her to find those resistance bands or to even that she didn't know how to use them. She bought them. I don't know very many people that buy resistance bands on their own if they don't know how to use them. So um, we put together a goal that those were gonna be on her nightstand and when she was relaxing in bed, um, she would just pull out those resistance bands and do some arm, you know, pulls or whatever, whatever she wanted to do and just be active. And she was very pleased with that afterwards. I love a little story. Um, so we got two quick questions. I've got actually a handful of questions from two people before we get to your last slide. Um, yeah. First, a comment from Kate. Thank you, Kate. I um, just wanted to say I really admire Amy's empathy for her patients. You've got fans mm -hmm. out there. Um, I, I also admire empathy for your patients. It's been really inspiring to be part of this webinar. So thank you for sharing all of this and for your patients and members sharing their story with you to share. I love my you know, member patients. There's a lot of sharing going on right now. I feel really good about what's taking place here in the webinar. Um, and shusma has got a couple of other questions for you. I'm going to throw them out to you and you can answer as you see fit. Um, how many members do you have? Are they mostly type one or do you have any type two patients? And also what do members like best about um, the steady health model? Wow. Okay. So um, we just hit our hundred member mark a couple weeks ago. And if you're not um, part of our Instagram family, do sign up and follow steady health on Instagram. Um, we, um, uh, Nilu, one of our, um, clinic uh clinic members are not members but uh clinic employees our member our member guide actually she manages our instagram account and has does a great job of keeping people updated on everything and some really fun stuff um but she just posted um about our 100th member a couple of weeks ago so that was a big milestone for us um, and we're still growing and actually with the with this whole shelter in place and transition of care to telemedicine we've seen a quite a large uptake in, um, in consult calls and memberships. So um, we started seeing mostly type one. Um, our founder has type one himself. And so the model just sort of geared toward his own experience um, and what he was hoping to gain out of creating a new way of providing diabetes care. But honestly, we have um, just as many type 2. We see gestational diabetes. We see prediabetes. We actually see the full gamut. But mostly, I would say, percentage-wise, type 1 right now. Um, but that, 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 that's an ever-changing number. And In terms the, of, yeah, and I guess, I, so I know you mentioned that part of the sort of evaluation process is talking with your members about what they like and don't like. So in terms of... Um, their feedback, what have you learned most from, from those sort of feedback opportunity sessions with them? Yeah, um, I think what they most like is the access to communication. They do not have to wait for that three-month follow-up visit with their endo or even a two-week follow-up with their diabetes educator. Um, in between appointments, and this is this actually is a perfect lead into my next slide, which is, you know, how do you keep that conversation going? It's huge for our members. They can reach out via our message platform and ask a question at any time of the day, um, leave a message for us, and whoever it's directed to will return that message very quickly during business hours. Um, so that is certainly one of the advantages. Um, we don't have a long lead time for scheduling a video appointment right now either. So that hopefully won't change <laughs> as we grow, but um, I mean, you can get a next day appointment if you need to, most likely with myself or Dr. Wu. 
Um, so that's a that's a great advantage right now. But everybody knows as the as 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 clinics grow, you know, appointment lead times shift. But we really have a goal of keeping those lead times very small and tight so people can get in. Um, one of the uh, probably the most common disadvantage um, is is just that startup to getting connected with your technology to you know so for so um, you know there are so many different diabetes platforms and um, therapies and getting connected to somebody's Dexcom or getting connected to somebody's Guardian um, sensor or getting connected to somebody's Libre or getting connected to somebody's uh, uh, Tidepool account or getting connected to somebody's in-pen data. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that has to happen and sometimes it happens quite easily but oftentimes it's not and it does take a few it it takes a little bit of effort for i'm going to say about 20 percent of the people that we work with we have to do a little bit more hand holding than, than we probably had hoped to do so that's an evolving thing but it's important to have that support and we hear we know it's not perfect yeah. Well, I mean, if, if there are problems with Tidepool, please let me know. Bring you know, I do. <laughs> this is true. Fun <laughs> fact for all you attendees out there. Amy actually has my cell phone number. She has called <laughs> me a couple of times whenever there are very specific issues. That's the level of support that we can provide. I just try not to give myself a number out to all of the Tidepool clinicians out there. Um, that said, um, I guess to you call me directly, um, continuing the conversation, I do want to make sure we cover the last bit of your presentation. Yeah, so the, the last, last the the slides. Yeah. yeah, so I think the last bit of information that I want to share here is, and that um, I'm going to talk about some things that are very specific to study health, but I think anybody who is starting to do telehealth, telemedicine really needs to think about how to incorporate keeping the conversation going in between those appointments more. It is critical. It is critical to keep people engaged. Um, so I mentioned earlier at the beginning that at Steady, we view what happens between those visits as important as what happens during a visit. And our goal really is to be able to share more vividly. And we do this through the data we collect, right? So the data that we collect is not only blood glucose data, but um, I showed you earlier um, a screen grab of our app where members can take images of the food that they're eating, that they can um, log their medication, that we can, they can make notes and say, I had a bad day, I had a good day. I don't like using those words. I had a challenging day. I had a, I had a, a really successful day, what, whatever the case may be. Um, it's very similar actually to how people can do logging on Tidepool, but it's just one less tool to have to use. Um, our messaging platform really is a lightweight tool to support that continued communication. Um, and through that messaging platform, we've created some really simple and some not so simple messages to share with members, both proactively and regularly. Um, so on the screen here are a couple examples of what we do. The first one on the left here is a copy of a progress report that actually Dr. Wu created. And uh, fun fact, Dr. Wu um, has an incredible design ability. And so he designed these and, excuse me, and um, we all agreed that being able to provide members with regular updates, kind of like um, Clarity will on, on a regular basis, send you a little thing saying your time and range for the last two weeks was X, Y, Z. We kind of just, you know, uh, rode that coattail and um, came up with our own version of that. So on a monthly basis, we will send out this monthly status report um, that reviews patients' goals, specific projects that they've identified to work on with either myself or with Dr. Wu. And then at the very bottom, Dr. Wu actually writes a nice little um, personalized note to the member. Now, what's nice about this is it doesn't require anything for the member to do, but it often leads to some really good questions and discussions that are started on behalf of the member, gets them thinking about what's going on. 
Um, the other thing that we do is we have something that we call an intervention threshold at Steady, where when members first come on board, we ask them if they would like a little reminder if their time in range drops below a certain percentage of time. And it's not to be a, hey, what's going on? Why is this happening? It's just a little, just wanted to let you know, you asked us to remind you when things were looking a little downhill, we see that. Or, and, and that's where we might send out this for the past two weeks, your time in range is below your lower limit, let us know if you need help. That will often lead people to say, yeah, I had a really rough week, or they don't have to respond because guess what? They know they had a rough week and we don't need to rub it in their face either. Um, but the best one is this center card. We call these our cards. And that is when patients get this little nice green card, happy green card with a big gold star saying you had a great last couple of weeks. And we get some really nice comments back from people. They really appreciate this. So um, I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. I'm looking at the time here. Um, I want to leave time for questions. Um, I do want everybody to know that I understand your clinic setup is likely very different than Steady Health, but what we're implementing, I think that everybody can implement as well into the larger clinic setting or an independent clinic setting. So thank you very much for welcoming me into your space. Cool. All right. Let's spend about five more minutes clearing out the rest of these questions. First from Liliana, um, how do you ensure patients come back um, after their first appointment? And I guess I would be a little more precise and say after that initial first week that you described, that is uh, yeah. very focused, very, very thoughtful, very purposeful. Um, mm -hmm. After that, sort of what is the follow-up process like? How, what's the appointment process like? I know that part of it is sort of on their demand, right? Yeah. Um, so we have follow-up scheduling challenges just like everybody else. Um, but what we understand at Steady is that we need to meet the patient or the member um, when they are ready. Mm -hmm. And that's not always at the time when we think they should have an appointment. Um, so we have a communication protocol that after that first appointment, if they haven't scheduled, we'll reach out in a week and ask them to schedule. If we don't hear from them in one week, we will reach out again. After that, we don't do anything until the end of the month. And then we start to pick up the communication again. Um, but most people, after that initial tracking period, it's amazing what Dr. Wu does and what, they, what he provides. Most people come out so motivated that they're like, yeah, I can do this. I want this. And it, they schedule it and you're like, whoa, I'm not ready. I haven't even reviewed your chart yet. And you have an appointment tomorrow with me. So okay. yeah. Cool. Um, awesome. So a question from Janice, are you able to share uh, your screen from, from your platform uh, with your patients whenever during their appointments so that you and your members are actually able to view the exact same reports and data and screens um, together, um, which will obviously facilitate a more collaborative conversation um, and share decision-making using that data. Yes, and that's a huge part of care is letting the member see what you see. Mm -hmm. um, data is not owned by anybody other than the member. Um, they are giving me permission to view what's going on with them. And it's my job to show them what I look for and how to identify patterns. And a big part of that is, yes, is, is you know, virtually turning the screen around and letting the member see our backend tool and what we're looking at. But then also I'll share the screen with any platform that I'm looking at. And so I often will have Tidepool up and share the screen on Tidepool and we go through and have some really great discussions and teach the people how I look at things. Cause hmm. I mean, my job, the goal of my job is to not have a job. I want everybody to know how to do this on their own. Nice. Um, so on that point, I think there's just a couple more comments here. Um, one from Christy. Thank you, Christy. Very inspired by this as someone who's encouraging our clients to use telemedicine platforms, uh, how to find um, and find how helpful and empowering they are. So nice. I mean, 
all these comments about the reader are all just kudos to you. So this is gonna be a nice little Amy Love Fest to close out um, the rest of this presentation. Can I give a virtual hug? I can, this is the this is the hardest part about doing telemedicine. <laughs> you can't give so you you're right. One. Yeah. So a comment from from Shushma. Very much enjoyed the presentation, Amy. Thank you. I love the practical tips. Do we engage do we engage patients? Loved your enthusiasm. Again, I'm just mm -hmm. gonna see, see, get you to blush by the end of this thing. Um, here's a comment from Jack. Kudos to both you and Christopher. You know, that's me. It's awkward. Um, but yeah, I've been seeing Amy for almost ten years, and her steady health transition has been a great continuation. Thoroughly enjoy the, the participation and uh, help that you give all of us PWD folks. Keep up the good work. All the best, Jack. Um, I love you, um, smiling Jack. And uh, one last comment from uh, from Joe. Uh, just thank you, Amy, for a great information and presentation. Um, yeah, I guess my final question, we've got 60 seconds, is yeah. um, is, there, is there anything that you miss about the in-person experience? Like you, we, we spent this past hour talking about the opportunities and advantages of telemedicine, of yeah. the virtual visit. Um, those are all fantastic things, but uh, is there anything that you do miss about the in-person experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a nurse. And we learn in nursing school that um, human touch is, it, it can do so much. Just putting your hand on somebody's shoulder when they're struggling, um, just sitting, moving your chair and sitting beside them. Um, I can't do that. And it's, um, it's hard. It's, it's really hard. I, I yeah. Um, the other thing that is very challenging for me, especially now being at home, this is my home office, um, is not having the coworkers to collaborate with, you know, and just yell around the corner and say, hey, Sabrina, or hey, Ruth, you know, like, what about this? Oh my gosh. Um, that's challenging for me. I'm a, I'm a verbal communicator and um, being able to talk with other people and work through challenges and situations is is how i do things best and um that has changed completely for me so i've had to yeah. learn i've had to learn a lot of new techniques for um reaching out for help and, and support yeah um so to that end go ahead and go thank you amy <laughs> again as a reminder everybody else out there typepool.org telemedicine that is your one-stop shop for all telemedicine-focused resources as we continue to put out new stuff. That'll be the place for all of you out there to go. And again, when in doubt, support at typepool.org. If you have a question, uh, if your patients have questions, if you as a person with diabetes have questions about Typepool, send an email there. That's the first place to start and we will help you out. That has been it for these practical tips for effective telemedicine. I'm gonna stop the screen share one last time, wave to this webcam on top of my monitor, and thank you all for thank attending. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks, Christopher.